We talk an awful lot about airplanes on this channel, but planes are not the only classification of what you would call an aircraft. Helicopters also populate the skies and have their own history. Today we are going to explore the deadliest helicopter disaster to have occurred in Europe. It involves one of the more distinctive looking helicopters, an aircraft that is more known for its roles in the military, but this was a passenger helicopter. So what happened that led to such a disaster? We need to know more about that particular helicopter and have a closer look at its inner workings. Today's video takes us to Scotland, or more specifically, the most northern archipelago of islands northeast of the Scottish mainland. Here we'll find the Shetland Islands. We've talked about this region before. Shetland is home to nearly 23,000 people. Being in a rather remote region of the world, the island cluster is connected to the rest of the world through Sumbra Airport, which itself lays on the very southern tip of the islands. This airport usually operates flights to and from several of the larger cities in the country, but is also a hub for helicopter flights for getting on and off offshore oil platforms. Shetland's location in the North Sea puts it within easy reach of the oil field here that is shared with the United Kingdom and Norway. It's not even the only place in Scotland like this. Aberdeen is also known for oil field helicopter flights. At the time, in 1986, these flights were operated by British International Helicopters. The company had recently just rebranded from British Airways helicopters and the helicopters themselves wore a livery resembling British Airways. The people who took these flights were, as you'd expect, typically those who worked on the oil platforms. British International Helicopters in 1986 operated the Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopter. This helicopter, first launching in 1961, is distinctive for its two twin rotors instead of the single and tail rotor that is often associated with the aircraft. The helicopter is popular among militaries around the world as a general utility and transport aircraft. It can be adjusted for cargo or people transportation. Although often associated with military use, the Chinook does have a variant for civilian operation, and so British International Helicopters found it to be useful for their operations. Over 1,200 of these helicopters have been produced, and they are still in production to this day. On November 6, 1986, the CH-47 Chinook registered as Golf Bravo Whiskey Foxtrot Charlie was to make several trips between Sumbra and the Brent oil field, which is located further northeast of Shetland at roughly 61 degrees north, around halfway between Shetland and Norway. The oil platforms and rigs out here are operated by the UK division of the Shell Corporation. The accident flight we need to look at was the first returning flight to Sumbra originating on Brent Platform C that morning. Coordinate position, North 610546, East 014318. The pilots of this aircraft had actually been flying here in Shetland instead of their usual base in Aberdeen. For three days they had been ferrying workers to and from the Brent oil field. Those pilots were 45-year-old Captain Push Vide, who had 10,000 hours flying helicopters behind him. He was joined on the flight deck by his 43-year-old co-pilot, Neville Nixon, who was also substantially experienced with just under 5,000 hours flying helicopters. The co-pilot was supposed to be flying in the afternoon, but swapped his shift with another pilot and took their shift instead that morning. The outbound trip was uneventful. Following the turnaround, the helicopter left Brent Platform C at 10.22 in the morning. On board were 44 passengers, taking time off from work offshore. There was also one flight attendant on board for a total of 47 people on the helicopter. At an altitude of just 2,500 feet, the aircraft cruised for its journey back to Sumbra. As stated, when the helicopter left Shetland that morning, it made the journey out uneventfully. The majority of this return trip would also be uneventful, until it came time for the approach. To delve deeper into what the mechanical failure that brought down the helicopter was, we should move to the moment of disaster and work backwards understanding how things went wrong. The Chinook approached from the north. For their arrival at the airport, they would use the shortest runway at Sumbra that's labelled for helicopters, runway 24. 
The helicopter was about four and a half miles from Sumbra at 11.30, and the control tower gave the pilots their clearance to land. According to the cockpit voice recording, the pilots began noticing an increase in noise in the cockpit. As the one member of crew who survived would later recant, it was a sort of whining sounding noise, followed by a loud bang. So what had happened to this helicopter? Helicopter engines typically fall into the category of what are called turboshaft engines. These differ from engines on an airplane, as the goal of the engine is not to produce thrust, but rather spin the rotor blades. As mentioned before, the CH-47 Chinook is distinctive because of the two large rotors on top. This helicopter's engine is located towards the rear, near the aft rotor. So for that energy produced by the engine to get to the rotor blades, it needs to be transferred onto the internal gear structure of the rotor. A spinning synchronization shaft that runs along the length of the helicopter connects to a gear train called a transmission. Because there are two large distinctive rotors on the Chinook, there is a forward transmission and an aft transmission. The two rotors are synchronized with the help of the shaft. This prevents the rotors from colliding. It is the forward transmission that needs closer analysis. This is an image of the recovered gear from the forward transmission responsible for this disaster. This is called a spiral beveled ring gear, according to the accident report. Photographed here is the top of the gear, which sits on the spinning synchronization shaft that is powered by the engine. This gear is what takes that energy to move the large rotor blade on top. It is obvious from these photographs where the failure occurred. Now that we've pinpointed the failure, let's find out why. The accident report highlights that the failure of this gear came from circumferential fatigue cracking of the attachment flange on this ring gear. A groove that had formed, likely from corrosion and general wear and tear, had weakened the strength of the gear. Additional factors contributing to corrosion included exposure to water and oil. As detailed in the accident report, the environment the helicopter was servicing, flying constantly over the sea at low altitude and spending time on oil platforms, exposed the inner mechanics of the rotor to additional potential corrosion. The report even says, and quote, this led to the initiation of corrosion fatigue cracking, which progressed downwards through the flange. Thus, the fatigue failure was related to the formation of the groove. The investigation also determined that the aft transmission never suffered the same level of fatigue as the forward transmission. That whining noise that was heard by the pilots just before disaster struck is believed to have been the deteriorating condition of the gearing system in that forward transmission set. Though noticed by the pilots, they weren't worried by the noise, though they did discuss what it could have been. The two sets of rotor blades were synchronized so that they did not collide. Because of the damage done to the assembly of the forward rotor, that rotor became out of sync. That loud bang that occurred at the moment of disaster was the two sets of rotors colliding with each other. In this moment, the helicopter became uncontrollable as you'd might expect. The aft rotor blades had separated from the helicopter the damaged forward rotor was still connected and spinning during this time. The front of the helicopter pitched up, the rear of the aircraft began to sink, and the helicopter began falling to the water below, rear end first. Captain Pushpavide attempted to recover the helicopter by manipulating its power controls. Under normal circumstances, this would have brought the helicopter level. What happened instead in this wounded state, as the surviving member of the flight crew would later describe himself, the structural integrity of the helicopter failed. The front end of the aircraft flipped over, the cockpit now facing the water and the rest of the aircraft still falling to the sea upright. The disintegration of the helicopter meant that the cabin would first fall to the sea, taking most of the impact energy and the cockpit would hit the water soon thereafter. As it turned out, a Coast Guard helicopter conducting a search and rescue training exercise had actually departed Sumbra just moments before the incident occurred. They quickly arrived on the scene. Out of the 44 passengers, just one made it out of the helicopter alive, found floating among other bodies. 
Captain Pushp Vide had also survived having escaped from the submerged and sinking cockpit and clinging to some floating wreckage. His co-pilot Neville Nixon, along with the one flight attendant, had also perished. One body of the deceased was never found, presumed dead. The Sumbera disaster became the deadliest helicopter crash to have ever occurred in Europe. In terms of death toll, it also ranks as one of the deadliest to have ever occurred globally. The investigation concluded that mechanical failure was the sole cause of the crash. It was also determined, given the nature of the catastrophe, that there was pretty much nothing the pilots could have done in that moment to save the helicopter. The failure of one component snowballed into the desynchronization of the twin rotor blades, leading to collision. More stringent maintenance was brought forward into British International Helicopters as a result of this accident. Surviving Captain Pushp Vide actually returned to flying helicopters just a few months after recovering from his injuries and being successful during medical examinations. He would still state that the Chinook was the best helicopter he had ever flown, despite the accident. British International Helicopters did retire the type, in favour of Sikorsky helicopters instead. The airline has never suffered a fatal accident since then. As for the Chinook helicopter, it is still produced to this day in various forms. Throughout the years, it has retained its popularity among world militaries for its utility. The helicopter, though, has now largely been phased out from other operations. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. This one was a little bit different, I certainly know less about helicopters and airplanes, so it was interesting to get into the research behind them, how they work, how they differ from planes, and so on. Also, the Chinook is a very interesting aircraft just on its own. Helicopter experts out there, let me know how I did, as I'm sure there'll still be plenty for me to learn. So, if you found this video to be interesting, be sure to leave a like and subscribe, as there is always a new video every Saturday. It is that time of the week again where I take a moment to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their ongoing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, thank you very much. Shout out this week to David Mayer for pledging last week, much appreciated. If you want to support the channel further yourself, consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. Thank you all so much for watching. If you want to follow my personal Twitter, that will also be linked in this video's description. Have a great day, and I will see you next weekend. Goodbye!